the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray includes, includes the phrase, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But why? Why did Jesus teach us to pray that? Isn't God's will always done? Why bother to pray it? Well, God is not the author of nonsense. He doesn't command us or teach us to do anything that is pointless. He never commands us or, or teaches us to do anything that's merely symbolic. This prayer has a purpose, and the purpose is pretty clearly demonstrated for us in Scripture if you know where to look. After all, the manifold testimony of Scripture is that in some manner, in some matter, God has subjected his will to our faith. God has subjected his will to our saving. In some matter, God has put his faith in us. For example, in Deuteronomy 11, 16 through 17, we find that when at the end of, his 40 year, of the 40 years wandering in the desert, the children of Israel were about to enter into the promised land, God, through Moses, gave them this solemn warning. But do not let your heart turn away from the Lord to worship other gods. If you do, the Lord's anger will burn against you. He will shut up the sky and hold back the rain, and your harvest will fail. Then you will quickly die in that good land the Lord is now giving you. Now, according to most biblical historians, this warning was given sometime around 1400 B.C. Now, I happen to think it was earlier than that. I think it was in about 1700 B.C., but let's go with the later date. That's all we need to make this lesson work. Let's say that this warning, that the chosen people of God, if they were to turn their hearts and worship other gods, then the Lord God would shut up the sky and hold back the rain was issued sometime around 1400 B.C. Well, how long was it after that that the Israelites began worshiping other gods? Well, practically the next day. Certainly within one generation. But how long was it before God shut up the sky and held back the rain? Over 500 years. Judges 2, 11 through 12, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed other gods. And the rain continued to fall. Judges 10, 13, the people turned from the Lord and served other gods. The rain continued to fall. 1 Samuel 8, 8, God said, they have forsaken me and served other gods. The rain continued to fall. First Kings 15:26, Nadab did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the rain continued to fall. And on and on we could go over a period of 500 years. The Israelites fell time after time into idolatry, and the rain continued to fall until, out of the blue, in First Kings. 17.1, we find the following recorded. Elijah, the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As surely as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And just like that, the will of God was done on earth as it is in heaven. For 500 years the will of God was not done. Then all of a sudden it was. Why? Did God issue a new decree? Did God come to Elijah and say, go to Ahab and say, was there a cataclysmic event of some kind? No. So what happened? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, at least not in so many words, but it does give us a clear indication that Elijah's motivation to do what he did came to him by the word of God. 
Elijah read his Bible and saved in it. Now that isn't the usual sort of divine transaction that you find among the prophets of the Old Testament. Usually, these things involve a call from God, some kind of direct theophany. Usually the Lord appears to the prophets or, or speaks to them through some media, whether in the form of an angel or a burning bush or a still small voice that happened to Elijah later, or by some kind of dream or vision. But Elijah isn't your usual prophet. The Bible tells us of 85 true prophets of God from Abel to Zephaniah, and of those 85, only two went to heaven without suffering death. Enoch and Elijah. Not even Jesus got to do that. Not even John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest of all the prophets, got to do that. No, Elijah is in a class almost by himself. Now, of Enoch, we know almost nothing. Of Elijah, we know a good deal more, but not nearly as much as I'd like to know. But what we do know is that there's no mention of him until 1 Kings 17. And when he appears in the pages of the Holy Scriptures, we find him acting on the written word of God with no apparent external motivation from God. Elijah didn't receive a new word from God. He acted on the word that had already been given by God to everyone in general. And nothing except for the word of God and the faith of Elijah is in evidence in verse 17. I mean, what was it that catapulted Elijah to the page of the scripture? What was the earth-shattering event that altered the course of history, both religious and political? What sign was given? What dream was dreamt? What healing was performed? None of that happened. Elijah picked up a Bible and read it and took note of what the Lord had already said to anyone who might bother to hear. And he saved in that. He abc in that. Now, that's what saving is. Faith is more than mere belief. Belief is worthless unless it's set in motion. Saving is belief in action. Saving is A, B, C. Action. Based on belief, sustained by confidence in God. And that's what Elijah did. He read the word of God. He didn't just believe it. He didn't just agree that it was true. He acted on his belief with confidence. When Jesus said to the woman with the hemorrhage, My daughter, thy faith has made thee well, he wasn't referring to her opinion or to her conviction that he could heal her. If that's what faith is, she could have stayed home and done that. But if she had, she would have died with that hemorrhage. No, the fading that saved that woman was A, B, C, action based on belief, sustained by confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Elijah was a favor of the first order, a favor of the highest degree. And who was Elijah? Nobody in particular. According to James 5.17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. All we know about him is that he was a Tishbite, which sounds like something you could treat with Campo Phoenix. <laughs> The word Tishbite itself simply means uh, captivity. So this could simply mean that Elijah was a slave or a foreign national of a conquered nation. So basically he was a nobody, persona non grata, a second class citizen. Conversely, the word Tishbite could refer to the town from which uh, Elijah hailed, indicating that he was a place called Tishbite. And if that's so, then it was a place so insignificant that no record of it exists in any history anywhere. As such, it indicates uh, insignificant and distant origins. It's like saying Timbuktu. 
and Elijah from outer Mongolia, or Pago Pago, Tierra del Fuego, or Old Matuli, or Milner. <laughs> Elijah was nobody of any consequence without any particular divine calling. As far as we know, What's amazing about Elijah is that he, being nobody in particular, managed to get an audience with Ahab in the first place. Kind of reminds me of Michael Fagan. And if you don't, uh, if that name doesn't ring a bell with you, Michael Fagan is the man who somehow made it past all the security layers at Buckingham Palace and went into the Queen's chambers at night and sat on the end of her bed. And uh, just started talking to her, and eventually he asked her, uh, did you have a cigarette? And she said, no, but my man does. And she opened the door, and he was quickly taken into custody. Now, Elijah wasn't crazy, but being crazy might have helped. I mean, could you imagine reading your Bible, being convicted by what it said, and saying, I need to get to the White House. Now, that's what we're talking about. But we're not talking about any state house, even as benevolent as the White House. It would be more like going to the uh, Sadabad complex in Iran and trying to get in to see President Hassan Rouhani, or harder yet, going to the Bay of Rabari and asking to see uh, Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran. You ain't getting in. Yet Elijah the Tishbite somehow got in. His coming was neither predicted nor heralded. Neither was it prompted by God, except that he had spoken 500 years earlier. His word. His word. Delivered to Moses by divine inspiration, breathed by God, recorded by Moses, and preserved, still living, but unbidden for 500 years. God's word given as a deposit of holy faith, but lying in silence, waiting for a man with the courage of his convictions to come along and do something in response to it. To what? To faith. To take action based on belief sustained by confidence in God. And that's what Elijah did. What action did he take? According to James, he prayed that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. He prayed, and God shut up the heaven. But Elijah didn't know that that's what would happen. There's no record of God ever telling Elijah, Okay, I'm going to act now. No. Nevertheless, with no drought in evidence, based on his belief in God and sustained by his confidence in God's word, Elijah went and stood before Ahab and said, As surely as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain for these years, but according to my word. And in so doing, he risked execution. Such is the character of this fearless man of God. And that's what's so troubling to me about the majority of modern translations of the Bible and the way that they have chosen to translate 1 Kings 19.3. Even Bibles that I have considered to be highly reliable. You see, in 1 Kings 18.20-40, through 40, we have the record of Elijah's showdown with the prophets of Baal. And I've, I've printed that for you in your bulletins. I'm not going to read all the way through it today. But... He took on these 450 prophets, and he proved Yahweh Elohim to be the one true God. Then Elijah released the curse and ordered the rain to fall, which rain came, and it came in with such a rush that Ahab had to bust Axel with his chariot to make it back to uh, his castle in Jezreel before the road became too muddy to travel. And Elijah, empowered by the hand of, of, of the Lord, ran so swiftly in the same direction 
that he overtook Ahab's chariot and beat him to the city gate. That's pretty remarkable. He wasn't uh, the least bit afraid of Ahab, afraid of Jezreel, afraid of Jezreel. Which is why it's so troubling to me that so many translators, assuming that the word Rawa must be misspelled in the Masoretic text, suggest otherwise in their renderings of 1 Kings 19.1-3, which in the ESV reads, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods to me, excuse me, so may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. And many other translators follow suit, translating this first phrase in, in 1319-3 with the a priori assumption that Elijah fled because he was afraid. The CSB, then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. The CEB, Elijah was terrified. He got up and ran for his life. The CEV, Elijah was afraid when he got her message, and he ran, and so on. But beloved, there's precious little textual evidence to suggest that raw law is misspelled in the Masoretic text here. And it is counterintuitive to suggest that it is. Now, if it is, then these translators, along with many others, do have it right. Elijah, who never showed any sign of fear prior to this moment or afterwards, had a momentary lapse of faith and was suddenly afraid of Jezebel which is possible, it was prior to any record of her putting on makeup before looking at the window. But, <laughs> I'm sorry for that, it seems pretty unlikely to me, considering Elijah's faith record in general. But if you don't assume that there's a mistake in the text, the Masoretic text being the gold standard of the whole text of the manuscript, and that it's not misspelled, then it appears that Elijah was not afraid. Rather, he saw the situation as it really was, which was different than he had hoped that it might be. This is the report of the ASV, the BRG, Darby, GMB, JUB, KJV, and several others, where they say um, that Elijah saw what had happened. Even the message of all translations get this part right. Because Eugene Peterson translates the first phrase in 1 Kings 19.3, when Elijah saw how things were. But that isn't all, because all the translations that say that Elijah was afraid also report that he fled, that he ran away. But again, this is not what it says in the Hebrew. Now here, the King James, among others, gets it right. And when he saw that, he arose and went. And the J.U.B. has, and when he saw that, he arose and departed. Because the Hebrew word that's translated to go here is Yolak, which contains in it no element of hate whatsoever. It means to go, to walk to depart, to proceed, to go away, or to lead, to bring, to lead away, to carry, to cause to walk. And this secondary meaning of to lead or to cause to walk indicates a deliberate act of the will, not a panic response. And this suggests that Elijah's going was an act of self-will. And this is why it seems to me that the Douay Rheims Bible here translates the word Yalak with the phrase and rising, uh, excuse me, and rising up 
he went whithersoever he had in mind. Elijah, as a conscious act of the will, and with malice aforethought, stopped what he was doing in the name of the Lord and walked away. Ahab apparently was grateful for the rain, but Jezebel wasn't. Instead, she dispatched a messenger to tell Elijah that she was going to do to him as he had done to the prophets of Baal. After all, the crowd corralled the prophets of Baal, but it was Elijah who put them to the sword, all 450 of them, single-handed. After which, he ran at top speed, faster than the horses of Ahab, toward Jezreel, toward Jezebel. Which, by the way, the current record for horses under harness is about 30 miles an hour. Uh, and this, the journey is about 17 miles. So he would have been running at over 30 miles an hour for 34 minutes or so. That's pretty remarkable. But even so, nobody instinctively runs toward danger at devil may care speed if they're afraid of what lies ahead of them. But Elijah wasn't afraid then. And he wasn't afraid three verses later when he learned that Jezebel planned to kill him. He wasn't concerned about losing his life, but he became deeply concerned about the well-being of his soul, which is the proper translation of the Hebrew word nephesh, which would have been in mortal danger if he ever lost faith. Yahweh Elohim. I know that not just because of the evidence that I've already presented to you, but because of where Elijah went when he walked away and what he said when he got there. According to 1 Kings 19, 3 through 4, and when he realized what had happened, he arose, and for the sake of his own soul, he walked away. When he came to Beersheba, Judah, he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day, and sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better at my job than my ancestors were at theirs. Elijah walked away from Jezreel not because he was afraid of Jezebel, but because he felt like a failure. Because at that point, he considered that his mission failed. That he had, and he had far too much faith in God to imagine that God was to blame, so instead he blamed himself. After all, you see, he had hoped that Ahab and Jezebel would be converted. That they would repent of their idol worshiping. And would be restored to faith with Yahweh Elohim. And here I can't ignore the similarity between Elijah and Jonah. After Jonah had prophesied to Nineveh, he went out and sat under a broom tree and prayed to the Lord. Uh, might kill him as well. Because as Jonah understood his mission, he would have been successful only if the people to whom he prophesied had rejected his message and had been destroyed by God. But after Elijah had prophesied to Israel, he went out and sat under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. Because as Elijah understood his mission, he would have been successful only if the people to whom he prophesied had heeded his words and deeds and had been restored to God. And this is confirmed by what took place when Elijah reached the cave at Horeb, the Mount of God. 1 Kings 19, 11-18, And the Lord said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, 
for the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah answered, I have been very jealous of the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord God said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And then Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. The one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu will Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees of whom have not bowed to Baal and every mouth of whom has not, just him. You see, God never intended to save Ahab and Jezebel. Just as with Pharaoh, God was intent on destroying them. And if Elijah had stuck around, it would very likely have fallen to him to put the two of them to the sword. And when he had done that, the 7,000, all the knees of whom had not bowed to Baal, and every mouth of whom had not kissed him would very likely have come out of hiding. But that didn't happen. Instead, Ahab was killed indirectly by Hazael when he went to war with the Arameans. Jezebel was killed by Jehu, and those who escaped, Hazael and Jehu, were killed by Elisha. So it took three men to replace Elijah, but replace him they did. And Elijah was put into semi-retirement. He anointed his successor, trained Elisha for his mission, and then was taken up in a chariot of fire. Now God still used him, but he never used him the same way again. Because when his mission failed to produce the outcome he thought it was supposed to produce, he lost heart to such a degree that for the sake of his own soul, he simply walked away. So God gave him a last few tasks, but then removed him from the equation, taking him with him to the heavenly places where, unlike everyone else who has died, he continues to work for the cause of the faithful. Which, by the way, if this doesn't persuade you that the original Star Wars movie was inspired by Scripture, I don't know what will, because if only wants to know me as a based on Elijah, I'll leave my hat. The point is that Elijah might have known victory in his natural lifetime if he had gotten so disheartened at Mount Carmel that he walked away from his mission. The walk away is right to the zenith of what most of us consider to be of greatest achievement, the shaming of the prophet to fail. He saw himself as an utter and complete failure, and he stopped. 
put down his sword, and walked away. Without ever even knowing that in so doing, he was abandoning 7,000 faithful souls who needed a leader. Well, beloved, I am not Elijah. I'm not as good as he was. I'm not as smart as he was. I'm not as brave as he was. I don't have as much pluck as he had. But if you'll excuse the self-aggrandizing analogy, Steamboat Springs has been my Jezreel. Emily and I are in our 14th year here, and this field has been the hardest either of us has ever worked. About as soon as we arrived here, I got involved in singing the Steamboat Chamber Singers and the Yampa Valley Singers. Then when Marie Carmichael left town, I called everyone together, organized them, and established the Yampa Valley Choral Society and served it as its president for about a decade, growing it into an organization with, at one point, seven singing ensembles. Over that time, I offered leadership, counsel, uh, and prayer with all who asked. And in my work with the choirs, I gave theological teaching on any sacred text that we would sing. And I was granted the opportunity to present the gospel to a broad audience when I wrote and produced and presented the Obscure Lanterns Illuminati, which became the talk of the town for a little while and even prompted a salon at the home of a prominent member of the community. Eleven years ago, we began broadcasting my sermons on the radio. The gospel, free to all. We were never asked for listener support, and was consistently given the church's contact information at service time in the broadcast. From this, we've had many dozens of contacts uh, from people that have, uh, from the broadcast footprint, which is really quite large, going from the Continental Divide to the Colorado border and into parts of Wyoming, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. I've answered many, many questions for people and have received many thanks to people who listen to the program, which list includes many of the ministers here in town. And Don Talapic, the man who owns all the stations on which we broadcast, tells me that every time our broadcast is preempted or interrupted, his phone rings off the hook. A couple of years ago, excuse me, a couple of years after we moved here, I began going to a men's Bible study that met over at the Agonai one week, and I quickly became the group teacher. I taught that group for four or five years. For years after that, any time a member of that group saw me anywhere in town, they'd say, I wish, wish you'd come back to really miss you. Two years ago, Emily and I did Sing for Your Supper and invited people into our home sing hymns and enjoy a nice meal. Over the course of the summer, we entertained about 25 guests who were not members of this congregation. We had a great time, and we sowed a lot of goodwill. And week after week, for the last 687 weeks, I have stood right here and delivered lessons that are informed and inspirational. And most of those lessons have been posted online where they have been very well received by viewers and listeners in every country in the world with millions of views and listens across several platforms. But by and large, over the course of that time, the response from the local community has been that of a resounding and prolonged yawn. It's indifferent. Punctuated by the occasional fit of anti-Christian rage. Sometimes Jezebel talks like she wants to kill me. I was cussed out online three times this week. Not unlike Elijah, I found that pretty stern. Because though I've never done anything as dramatic or as 
excessive or as confrontational as Elijah, I, like him, have expected. And my efforts would result in a certain kind of outcome. Renewed minds and hearts turn to God. And I, like Elijah, have felt pretty alone in my work sometimes, pretty isolated. Now, I have to tell you that this congregation is amazing. Their dedication is second to none. And though most of them can't be here, frankly, most of the time, they watch online. They send notes of encouragement, and they give consistently. This congregation is small, but mighty in its faith. Our members give at 11 times the national average. But over the course of the years, though our numbers have remained pretty steady, most of our local members have moved away. And most of our new members are from out of town. And even before COVID, our winter attendance has been pretty slow, pretty low. Small. Prior to the quarantine, there were a few Sundays when, come service time, the only ones here were me, my wife, who doesn't even attempt to mask her boredom when I see. <laughs> Shane, who lives with us, so kind of has to come, and one other person. And in moments like those, it's pretty easy to understand why Elijah did what he did in 1 Kings 19, 3 through 4. When he realized what had happened, he arose, and for the sake of his own soul, he walked away. When he came to Beersheba, Judah, uh, he left his servant there, and he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day, and sat down under a broom tree prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better at my job than my ancestors were at theirs. But beloved, that's why I'm so grateful that we have the record of Elijah and his ministry preserved for us in the pages of the Holy Scripture. Because while I'm not capable of duplicating his feet, I'm perfectly capable of duplicating his failures. But I'm determined by the grace of God not to do so. I don't know what would have happened if Elijah had stayed in Jezreel, but I know what happened when he walked away, and I sure as shooting ain't going to do that. I'm not ready to quit. I'm not ready to anoint my successes. I'm not ready to train some young upstart to take my place, to be twice as good as I am. But I'm more than ready to go out in search of the 7,000, all the need of whom has not bowed to fail. And every mouth of whom has not kissed him. That's why I invited all of you here today. That's why we've invested however many thousands we've invested over the last two or three weeks in this massive media campaign that we've been doing on the radio and Facebook and YouTube and TikTok and Snapchat and Reddit and Twitter. God will do with Ahab and Jezebel as he sees fit. He does them in and in them. My concern is for those who have ears to hear. Those who have eyes to see. Whatever number there is of those within 30 or 40 or 50 miles of this building who have not bowed to me to fail. Whatever number it is of those who don't worship human ingenuity. Whatever number of those there is that do not worship their children. Whatever number of those there is that do not believe that ultimate truth lies within themselves. Whatever number of those there is who do not pray to the universe. Whatever number of those there is who do not believe that faith and science are mutually exclusive. 
whatever number there is of those who find no comfort in the word, imagine there's no heaven. Whatever number there is of those who receive the Bible as the supreme written norm by which the conscience of the believer is to be bound and by which the church is to be governed in all matters of faith and practice. Whatever the number of such people there are, in a certain radius of where I'm standing right now. And you, beloved, are a down payment on that number. And if you'll stick around and stay with me, we'll find the rest of them. We'll find them together. That's my lesson for today.